Let's see. All right, so we're going to get going. Um, I do want to say, um, as we are coming out of the COVID um, situations, just to trust your the leadership at your extension office and to check in with them routinely to see what's what the latest is. Okay. Um, and today we have our um, agroecology webinar, and our next webinar is going to be by Evan Bean on impro improving soil health. So we're looking forward to that. And um, that'll be on the 24th of March. We've got some great ones coming up this year for sure. And remember for the webinar to uh, limit the use of the chat box for asking questions for the speaker and not for side conversations, but you can also use the question and answer function as well on Zoom. And I did want to announce you guys are the first uh, group to know that we will be having the Master Gardener State Conference in Kissimmee, October 16th through 19th. So that is uh, coming up. Um, let's see. Um, Emily Sandra is having a little bit of issues with um, black screen only with Wendy's name on it. So I'm, I do, my video is running Sandra, so we should be good, but maybe Emily can help you a little bit. So thank you for moving over to Better Impact. We're almost a year on Better Impact now, or My Impact, so I appreciate your patience as we move to the new volunteer software, and um, you all are doing a great job on that. Um, Elaine Cohen, will the state conference be on Zoom? Well, yes, it will be. So we are going to be in person. And of course, the in-person conference is going to be, you know, uh, as much of in-person fun as we possibly can. We're going to be having fun shops with um, uh, interesting hands-on. Um, and then we'll have our tours. We're going to have a lot going on in person, but we are going to be able to live stream the presentations because... Um, a lot of us do want to attend. There will be a cost associated with that. It won't be free, um, but we are going to have a Zoom option for the conference. Okay. So our presenter today is uh, Dr. Zach Brim, and he is with us. He is a UF IFAS Extension Specialist uh, from the Agronomy Department. He is located in South Florida at the Tropical Research Education Center in Homestead, my old stomping grounds. Um, he uh, really focuses on uh, urban agriculture. Um, no, that's not true. I, I'm sorry, I left that. A uh, urban, uh, sorry, agro systems, uh, agroecology. That's a typo. I'm going to click past it, Zach. I'm sorry. Um, he got his education from the University of Michigan for his two first two degrees and Utah State in ecology. And so he really, his program really looks at how to get our agricultural and growing food systems to be more compatible with nature and um, preserve our natural resources. So Zach, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing now. And I'm going to let you share. Please welcome aboard. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy, for the opportunity to be here and and introduce myself uh, to the group, uh, some of the things that I'm thinking about in, in agroecology. Um, and a lot of that comes down to, to plant diversity and uh, things that I'm interested in, both uh, across research and extension. So uh, hope to have a, a nice conversation uh, with you folks today. And I'm stalling just enough to get my uh, slides there, which you should now see uh, on your screen. Right. So there has been this uh, nagging question uh, since joining the university and, and doing this work uh, for me, which has been to address the challenging question of uh, why agroecology, but perhaps more what is agroecology and how do I do agroecology? And so uh, this is a program that I've put together uh, to try and answer some of those questions, but also uh, engage you folks in helping me answer that question, because it's one that's very challenging uh, to answer given the unique context of any place that you're working to grow food. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm here to encourage you to add uh, food production uh, into your gardens, into your farms, add biodiversity uh, and uh, kind of 
work through these uh, steps uh, in order to bring some synergies from nature uh, into uh, food production. So today I'm just gonna talk about the first steps to agroecology and, and uh, those are knowing uh, your agroecosystem and, and planning your agroecosystem. Uh, so just uh, starting off right away, uh, why agroecology? Uh, and, and for me, it's, it starts with an appreciation of nature. Uh, nature uh, feeds our soul. Uh, it also provides us not just with these opportunities for recreation, but the critical services for uh, human survival. Uh, the water, the plants, uh, the food, the pollinators. We can go on an exhaustive list of ecosystem services, uh, but for me, getting back to nature and appreciating that uh, as we produce food uh, is uh, critically important. Now, as important nature is, uh, nature is disappearing. I'm sure we all experience this in our counties. In Miami-Dade, it's uh, no better example than the Pine Rockland fragmentation. Uh, so uh, outside of the Everglades, there are 2% left of Pine Rockland, the natural forested habitat uh, down here in, in the county. And really what it comes down to is the Rockland habitat is the upland, it's the drier areas, it happens to be prime real estate. Uh, also, if you don't uh, maintain fire in these systems, in Rockland systems, they'll, they'll move from a pine Rockland into a, a hardwood hammock. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this is just a critical uh, trouble when uh, we're trying to keep uh, nature uh, around. Not only is nature getting squeezed out, but also agriculture. Uh, here in Miami-Dade uh, in 1954, we had just short of 200,000 acres. Uh, recently, it's uh, less, than, less than half of that. And, and so uh, the urbanization is coming in, but also the, the land use uh, is being shifted around. And, and agriculture happens to be a nice buffer, perhaps a middle, middle ground between nature and, and the urban. Of course, so everybody needs to eat. And, and so this is another critical uh, use for, for our land. So in, in my mind, this is something that uh, maybe uh, doesn't get talked about a lot for, for the sensitive nature of the topic, but it kind of starts with how many people there are in the world. So this was taken uh, last October. The United States at that time had over uh, 300,000 uh, people. We are approaching the 8 billion uh, mark uh, in, in the world. And people need food, people need shelter. Uh, and, and people take up land. And, and so the agroecology comes in with sort of understanding these trade-offs and, and how to really support uh, our, uh, our societies, our communities uh, with food and, and, and nature. Uh, so is agroecology so the solution? Uh, can it uh, kind of come to the rescue of these uh, vexing problems? These are global problems. These are problems that everybody experiences. I'm not here to say that uh, agroecology is the answer, but I'm, I'm here to promote it as one of the things uh, that folks can do in order to appreciate the importance of nature and the balance that food production has uh, with uh, urban land and, and natural areas. So just to jump in then, uh, what is agroecology? What am I trying to, to get you to do today? Um, well, for me, the definition of agroecology comes down to a few core principles. And, and those principles are here, which were summarized from a survey that I did uh, across uh, literature in agroecology. And these were the topics that came up time and time again. So agroecology is productive. It is sort of different in terms of natural areas. So an agroecosystem and a natural ecosystem are different critically in the produ production uh, that uh, is inherent uh, in, in agricultural systems, that in, in, um, inherent and uh, specific uh, dedication to productivity. Now, uh, similar uh, to that productivity, we can include biodiversity. Uh, raise the number of species, raise the areas with which they can live and interact, 
in order to help that productivity, that intentional productivity. Uh, resilience uh, comes along with biodiversity as well. Uh, what happens after a major uh, drought or a weather event or a uh, change in market dynamic? And, and so having that biodiversity helps the productivity. It also ultimately uh, supports the resilience of uh, these systems. That last piece is another critical thing here, that they're agricultural systems. Uh, that agroecology appreciates the connectedness, the interaction, the complexity of agro, uh, agricultural systems uh, in uh, the way that we uh, produce food, uh, fiber, and uh, many other uh, things that uh, can be plant-based to support our, um, our, our life, our communities. Uh, and so just to think about that in a different way, uh, this sort of uh, focus on production, biodiversity, resilience is with respect for your agroecosystem. So this is a place-based concept. I struggled with answering what is agroecology over the last several years uh, because it's so different from uh, place to place. And so the answer to what is agroecology can be different based on your agroecosystem. Uh, so I just wanted to slap this up. Um, the, if you're sort of interested in taking the dive into what is agroecology, I've put uh, together a collection of, of readings. And so you can follow this uh, link or you can uh, find uh, the link uh, through this, this QR code. So Wendy, do we have any questions that we want to stop for or should I continue on? Um, not yet. Let me double check. Okay. Um, hang on just a sec. Oh, yes, from Kathy. Is regenerative farming part of agroecology? Yes, absolutely. Uh, regenerative agriculture, building soil health, bringing that resilience into your system. Absolutely. Uh, it's one of the challenges with uh, agroecology uh, because there's so many uh, terms and synonyms or, or other sorts of uh, efforts and, and, and programs that sort of go after similar goals. Uh, uh, permaculture is another one to, to think about, organic agriculture, sustainable agriculture, all of these things uh, relate to agroecology and relate to themselves. Uh, the kind of uh, goal that I have for uh, today and, and this program is to provide uh, an approach, a, a way to uh, plan and, and map your agroecosystems uh, in order to appreciate that diversity of options to improve uh, resilience and, and biodiversity in your, in your agroecosystem. So great question. Regenerative agriculture, very supportive. Build that soil, certainly. Um, also, um... Folks would like you to go back. They weren't expecting the QR code. They'd like to oh. go ahead and grab it. Okay. I'll also share it at the uh, very end as well. So um, okay. I'll count to 10 and leave it here for anybody who's got that opportunity. And then I will, uh, I'll leave it up uh, during the question and answer session as well. Okay. And then everyone remember that when this is, um, the presentation will be loaded as the webinar is um, posted on the Master Gardener website. You'll be able to grab that at that time as well. So, very cool. Thanks. Okay. So, I addressed what is agroecology productivity, biodiversity, resilience, and agricultural systems. So, that last piece is something that I want to dive in a little bit. What is an agroecosystem? So this is an agroecosystem concept that I put together uh, with our graphics team at uh, IFAS, and it just has the many components uh, that I think about when defining an, an agroecosystem. And so you have your crop, and then you have all the things that like to eat your crop, and then you have all the things that like to eat what likes to eat your crop, and then you have what's in the soil, and then you have what's around your farm and uh, around your region and around your uh, your, your area all interacting. And, and so those interactions, as I mentioned, is a critical part of the ecology of an agricultural system. And I like to kind of start here as a thought experiment. Uh, and later on, we'll take this sort of abstract concept and relate it back to, um, to your agroecosystem. 
And so just kind of building off on that, I, I like to think about agroecosystems from a focal crop, but uh, maybe that's a little bit oversimplistic, right? We can have many focal crops. We can have many things that we're trying to accomplish with our garden, with our farm, uh, but uh, really in terms of the emphasis of intentional production, uh, it's important to sort of identify where you're focusing your effort and that productivity. Then you go from that individual focal crop into a population. So instead of just a single tomato plant, you have a whole uh, field of tomato plants or a collection. And, and depending on how big that population is or what's in between the population and interacting with the population, you'll have a little bit different ecology that goes on. Uh, part with that uh, population of a single plant, you can have multiple plants and multiple plants uh, relate to that community level. So multi-species cropping systems, cover crops, rotations, these are all very important aspects to doing agroecology. Again, another way to increase biodiversity. Each of these plants will play a little bit of a different role uh, in the system, whether it's just a ground cover or it's big juicy tomatoes, it's a windbreak, and the list goes on. Then once we go past plants, uh, there are a whole bunch of different communities as well. Uh, I, we heard at the beginning of the, the webinar, all the different folks that are interacting with their native plants and their native pollinators. These are all parts of our, of our ecosystem. We also have the, the browsers, the deer. Uh, I'm sure several folks have chickens or, or squirrels. And some of these uh, players uh, have, have good roles that we can recognize. Some of them are a little bit more challenging to the system. But in aggregate, the idea of agroecology is that building biodiversity builds cycles of, of life uh, that can ultimately uh, increase productivity and uh, resilience. So just kind of shifting the plants uh, to the top uh, and, and kind of uh, building our system. We can go from the ecosystem, focusing on the biology, focusing on the uh, plants and, and animals that are existing in our system. But it's really important for me to also acknowledge those uh, broader scales, the food system, right? We're not just producing food to toss it in our compost. We're producing food to, to eat it, to consume it, to share it with our neighbors to uh, transport it into urban centers uh, to support uh, folks in, in food deserts. And, and so kind of having a sense of where your system fits in within the broader picture is also a critical uh, idea, notwithstanding the just infinite scales of space and time, right? And so thinking about this uh, really stretches uh, your idea of where you fit uh, in, but it, but it gives you a sense of kind of how to relate to the world that uh, you're interacting with. So then how about your agroecosystem? That's uh, a key part uh, of here. I was pleased to hear uh, uh, the emphasis on, on uh, your garden plan. And, and that's kind of a, a similar uh, structure that I, that I put to this. Um, but uh, I really like to have folks envision uh, what their agroecosystem is. What do, you, what do you call it? Is it just your garden? Is it your yard? Is it a tomato farm? Uh, is it an orange grove? Uh, is it a uh, food forest or uh, you know, other, other sorts of re uh, you know, farm regeneration? There's all sorts of ways to think about this. And, and, and these are the, the sorts of language uh, that I'm working to bring out uh, in, in agroecology. Um, so let's see. Uh, so, okay, I'm gonna stop again uh, for questions about agroecosystems. We do have a question. And um, does farming with mixed plants, uh, is that also a part of agro agroecology, such as the Rauramuri indigenous planted corn with beans? Yeah, sure. Um, I, so multi-species cropping systems, whether it's an intercrop like the, um, the system uh, that you just described, uh, the corns, beans, squash, uh, if it's crop rotations, uh, if it's intercropping, uh, some folks will do the cover crops and then uh, just uh, do uh, strip tilling or minimum tilling. You know, all of these things are certainly uh, agroecology. Now, the extra layer that goes into this, which is what I'm trying to emphasize today, is that match to your system. So I've had a farmer down here in Miami-Dade try the indigenous uh, three sisters model do the corn, the squash, and the beans. It didn't work down here. At least the first time he tried it, 
corn has a really hard time down here in uh, the extreme of South Florida. Uh, you can do it at commercial scales, uh, but uh, the system that he had couldn't get the corn going. And so then he didn't have something for the beans to grow up. Uh, bush beans is more common down here than, than the vining beans. And, and so there's very much local knowledge uh, that should be incorporated into your decisions uh, that'll lead you to matching your uh, system uh, that would have sort of those qualities of agroecology uh, into uh, your, lo your local uh, setting. So that's a great question. It's a great answer also. Um, I think we're keeping ready to go on. I do want to let you know that we have 210 people tuned in. So we're having Very a great good. crowd today. So thank, thank you. you. All right. I got to write that number while you remind me. <laughs> <laughs> good. I invite your friends. We still have a little ways to go. Sure. Um, Okay, so so that was just kind of the the conceptual uh, description of where I'm coming from. This is this is my worldview. This is how I think about agriculture and and ecosystems and the interaction between natural agriculture and, and urban areas. Um, this next part is the so what do you do? Okay, so I'm with you. I, I, I share this goal. I, I like what you're saying. I want to bring nature into, into my agriculture. I want to bring food into my garden, however it is. Uh, the next part of this talk is, is the two steps for you to get started. Um, and I'm looking for a, a community of like-minded folks that, that want to jump into agroecology. And I'm going to try to bring you along in this way. So step one is knowing your agroecosystem. And you do that with these four steps. So one is, it kind of feels silly, get organized. Uh, but it's a critical step in order to do the following, uh, which is map your land, map your infrastructure, and, and map your resources. Uh, now let me uh, expand on that in a, in a way. So, so get organized. What do you got to do? Well, I, I very much encourage you to have a notebook or a folder. So you can, you can do this digitally. You can do it uh, with paper or uh, you know, whatever your favorite uh, system is, notes on your phone or, or whatever. Um, but it's, it's important to me to sort of start these lists or, or jot down these ideas uh, so that because there's so many things to think about, uh, keeping yourself organized with photographs, with lists uh, is, is a, for me, a critical first step. Then the second step is, is map your land. Um, so get to know it from uh, the vantage point of your boundary. Uh, so on the left is the Tropical Research and Education Center where I'm calling in from today. Uh, these are our 16 blocks. You can see our quarter acre uh, broken up into 16. Uh, so a satellite image is a great way to grab a map of your land. Uh, if you want a little bit more of a blank page to work from, then uh, I think uh, a land survey is a great way uh, to go. And, and, and or Or just Take a blank sheet of paper, and, and if your uh, land is a rectangle, start with a rectangle. If it's got some, some uh, kind of uh, sideways uh, or roundabout boundaries, you know, you, you can try to jot those down. This is just a, just a, a brainstorming tool uh, to, to get started, to stay organized. These steps are more important to me in, in that you've really thought through the extent of your agroecosystem. So where are the places on your land that are able to be, uh, to, to work or where are places of your land that you gotta stay away from, right? If you have a big electricity pole somewhere on your land, you probably don't wanna be spraying water on it daily. You know, so, but where does your electricity come from? Where does your gas come from? Uh, where's the water? This is probably something for a lot of folks that have adopted the, uh, the, the drip line, right? You're not going to put your drip line over your driveway. Maybe, maybe some folks are, uh, but that might have an impact on the decisions that you make for your agroecosystem. Uh, notwithstanding the assets here, I put a little treasure box uh, and, uh, you know, a dollar with, with wings, uh, but uh, kind of having a sense of where you're coming from. Are you, are you at an experimental stage? You're doing it as a hobby and can just put money into it and have some fun. It doesn't matter what you're doing, or are you doing this for a living? And you got to put money in knowing that you're going to get money out. So, so uh, these are the critical things where you're storing your equipment, what kind of equipment you have, uh, you know, where you are day to day. 
So the next step, once you've got your infrastructure and assets down is the biological resources. And this is really where, where I like to think about things and, and emphasize the thought experiment. But again, wh where's your water coming from? What's the quality of your water? Are you, are you pulling it up out of the aquifer? Are you taking it out of, your, out of the utilities? Uh, what's your soil? Uh, we've talked about sand a bit. I have rock. That's what we work with here. If, if I wanna make a hole in the ground, I have to use a pitchfork or an auger. Uh, drilling holes and trenching holes is just a whole new thing for me. Uh, and notwithstanding the, the very high pH, eight to eight and a half. Um, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second, Zach. Yes, ma'am. This is my soil sample from the farm I grew up on. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Can you see That's it? Right. It's a big chunk of rock. Oh, I can't. Oh, I, I uh, oh, oh, I got one too. I got one. <laughs> there you go. Uh huh. Yeah. You got to crush it up to, to, to farm, right? Cool. Um, yeah, that was a whole new thing. Like in order to do agriculture down here, row crop agriculture in the Redland, you got to make your soil. You got to start with a bulldozer and crush it up if you're not one of the lucky ones to be in the floodplain, uh, right? If you don't have that nice marl uh, river soil, uh, then, then, then you got to, you're dealing with rock. Cool. Um, so we got the water, we got the soil, uh, the plants. So are there big trees in your land? Are you gonna, you know, those shade? Uh, are those uh, habitat for birds? Uh, sort of what's, uh, I'm gonna say it this way, what's in the way, uh, but really what's kind of gonna stay? Uh, what is going to be a focal point around which you're planning your, uh, your system? What, what kind of seeds do you have access to? Are you interested in livestock? I, I've got a, a chicken and a, and a horse here. Um, are you next to a uh, natural area to, to bring pollinators in or are you up against the urban that we talked about earlier? And, and then perhaps uh, uh, more critically than anything is, is what's your network? Uh, who are the people that are involved in your agro ecosystem? Are you just trying to feed your family? Uh, are you trying to run a booth at the local market? Are you, again, doing this for a livelihood and got to make sure that you make your contracts uh, and, and uh, to the distribution center on time? So uh, really uh, critical things to think about that just that shut, set up your intimate knowledge of your system. In, in some ways, this is uh, trivial because I expect farmers and gardeners to have this information already. Like your intuition is to know these things. This process here that I'm suggesting as far as step one to know your uh, agroecosystem is to be deliberate about it. You know, go find things that you might not have seen before or, or think about it in a more uh, intentional way uh, in order to put your plan together. Okay, so that's step one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move through step two and then we can talk about doing agroecology uh, towards the end. So plan your agroecosystem. Okay, now you have a map, you have a list of, of your resources, you have an idea of, of what your starting place is. As you're doing that, I'm sure you're getting ideas of what you wanna do next. And that's exactly what this step two is. It's a plan your agroecosystem. Now, perhaps what distinguishes uh, the agroecology uh, planning from a Florida-friendly landscape plan or a garden plan uh, for master gardeners is a defining a target within the bounds of agroecology's goals. So I mentioned productivity. That's a common one, right? That's kind of standard agronomy. Uh, but also including biodiversity and resilience in your target uh, is, is really what distinguishes agroecology uh, from, from other approaches. Now, because many of these things take time to do, it's more of a think in the future and then work backwards. So I've just started kind of arbitrarily with a five-year goal. I think five-year goals are good to be manageable. That's right about where I am uh, with uh, my uh, backyard uh, garden. Um, and then once you do your five-year goal, uh, then you get to do that one-year goal. So now that I know where I wanna be in the future, what is it that I have to accomplish uh, this year? So define your target. I'll just kind of say it one more time, that production, doesn't come along itself, right? It comes with trade-offs. If you really wanna produce, if your goal is to crank out as much tomatoes as possible, then you're probably gonna give up on some other things. In South Florida, it means you're probably gonna to have to put on some uh, fungicides and, and other sorts of pest uh, 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 products, at least commercially. 
in order to maximize that productivity. That's going to have an impact on your diversity and re your resilience. So that target, thinking about it in this way among the trade-offs is really where agroecology has its power. That you're thinking about these ecological trade-offs uh, and, and, and emphasizing. So this is why I can't give people an answer. What is agroecology? Or how do you do agroecology? Because it really shakes out to what is your philosophy? What is it that you're trying to accomplish with your land? I hope it's uh, improving uh, your soil. I hope it's improving diversity. I hope that there's resilience built into it. Uh, but the answer doesn't have to be the same for everyone. Uh, and, and so uh, that's kind of where I come from, thinking about diversity as an investment, thinking about resilience as a priority. That's where we start seeing those uh, outcomes come from, from doing agroecology. So uh, this is uh, several different examples of a multi-year plan. Uh, we're uh, working with uh, the garden program at my kid's school. And, and so we just uh, started a new uh, garden box, uh, which uh, we drew up here with a picture of, of that spot uh, at the school. Um, I've got a farmer here in the Redland who's just getting started. So this is his uh, place and, and his uh, plan to put up some mango trees and, and some caimito. Uh, there's a, a nice uh, couple others, uh, of course, the Florida friendly uh, landscaping uh, example is here, uh, edible uh, garden and, and, and food forests. And, and so you know, these can take on many forms from drawing on a picture to drawing on a blank page to getting really fancy with, uh, with your um, kind of landscape uh, planning uh, and, and technology. So I, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm not quite an artist. I, I do more caricatures and cartoons. Um, but uh, just going through that process uh, is, is, is really important for this approach. Um, okay, I'm going to say one more thing before I go on. Uh, this is what if you can imagine this is your five year plan, uh, then the net last step would be, hey, what is it that I want to accomplish this year? What's my step. What's the first thing that we did when we moved to Redland was we got some bananas. And, and now it's a whole big bunch of bananas uh, that covers a, a good part of my, my side yard. Uh, we've since added uh, passion fruit and, and mango and, and all sorts of things, but it doesn't all happen at once. And so being thoughtful about those stages um, and the ecology of that, right? A big tree doesn't start out as a big tree. It starts out as a small tree. Uh, so so kind of how do you grow uh, your system in, in that thoughtful way? How, how does your system regenerate over time? Okay. I just want to encourage everybody to do some agroecology. I'm, I'm here to help and uh, hope that uh, we can kind of strike up a, a conversation about that. And, um, uh, you know, that's this is, this is the... Uh, approach that I'm trying to uh, encourage you folks to take on to map your agroecosystem, to plan your agroecosystem, and then to take some action. Uh, kind of try one thing, try a new uh, crop, try uh, uh, to add biodiversity, to rotate some things, to emphasize uh, resilience in a way, whether that's windbreaks or uh, pollinator uh, services. Uh, anything goes uh, when it comes uh, to agroecology if it fits your goals. Uh, related to agroecology and, and, and your system. Uh, so my take action challenge for you today uh, is just to get started helping me identify what is agroecology. So um, I'm on Twitter, uh, you know, folks uh, use all sorts of social media. Uh, this uh, hashtag can be used anywhere. Uh, but if you want to reach out to me uh, at Zach Brim, uh, you know, show me uh, that's agroecology for, for you. Um, I'll just leave that up just for an extra second before we oh we, leave it up on. leave it up okay I will <laughs> leave it up because the last thing just gives my contact information and that okay. link that I promised you so so maybe we'll start talking here and then uh, after the first couple uh, questions or discussion topics I can uh, move into that last slide with my my contact information that sounds good so I've got some really great feedback um uh, Dr. Mason says, as a professor myself, you're doing an exceptional job. She loves your presentation, so that's Thanks. good. Um, and uh, Basim Hilal from uh, Seminole County was wondering a little bit about um, history of how people incorporate composting into agroecology. Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, uh, so I started uh, That's Agroecology thread a couple of days ago, and my example uh, was the food scraps that I gave to my chickens. So I trade food scraps for compost and eggs. 
uh, and, and that cycling within the system. I didn't get into a lot of that in the description of the ecology and agriculture, um, but those interactions, those cycles are exactly how we promote resilience in our systems. Uh, so compost is a great example uh, to recycle uh, nutrients. And, and so any way that you do that, whether it's through uh, within your system, uh, kind of uh, dropping your crop and allowing it to uh, decay or promoting cover crops, now, uh, Redland is, I, I, I came from the Midwest uh, uh, and the Northern latitudes like Wendy uh, included in the introduction. And so down here, it's just a whole world at the extreme, at the, at the end of the world, if you will. I've done some cover crop experiments here in the Redland and we see the nitrogen leave the system in seven days. We see the biomass leave the system in two months. So, so it's like, is cover crops a great option for the Redland? Well, maybe if you're doing cover crops for weed control and nematode suppression, maybe that's a good reason to do cover crops, but, but it's not necessarily a match with building organic matter. Um, so composting, again, is another great way to keep organic matter in your system and, and to build that up. Um, and and, and uh, I think we can all get together to uh, encourage kind of more composting programs uh, across our communities. Well, Basim is an amazing gardener in uh, the Sanford area, so he, he will take that to heart. Um, oh, Joan, Joan Rayford is asking, um, how, what do you think about how do raised beds fit into this system? Uh-huh. I think raised beds are an important option. Uh, raised bed can certainly be an agroecosystem. You might name raised bed as, so I've got one here. Uh, can you see my, my pointer? That's, that's supposed to be a raised bed next okay. to the uh, farmhouse. Right, and, and so uh, herbs in a raised bed, or uh, these are, uh, you know, if, if you're in an urban setting, if you have no other option but putting a plant in a container, that's an important piece, right? Bringing food to wherever you are uh, is, is kind of one of my, uh, uh, one of the things that I'm trying to encourage, uh, right? Kind of imagine what your neighborhood block would be like if uh, we encourage biodiversity and, and food production across the board. Uh, and if your option is a raised bed, that's important. Like I mentioned, down here in the Redland, we have to build up, right? And so uh, figuring out uh, if you can't build a trench into the rock, then you got to build up. Um, a whole other thing to think about would be where does the material come for your raised bed? Are you just going to the box store and buying several bags of, of whatever it is, uh, compost or, or potting mix or whatever? Are you bringing in uh, mulch from the local landscaping company. There are a lot of different options that uh, kind of relate to uh, the resilience and the sustainability, right? You might get compost from your local landscaping company, but it's riddled with weeds. So, so you're like, keep the biomass in your neighborhood, but you got some consequences, which might be different than uh, the, the plastic that you might bring in from the bags of compost that you, that you buy from the store. But then maybe you don't have to worry about weeds as much. And, and this uh, really articulates the trade-offs that I'm trying to uh, try to encourage everybody to think about. Great, great answer. Um, Gay Tree um, has a decent sized backyard garden with 10 fruit trees, lots of vegetables right. and pollinator plants. At that scale, is that considered agroecology? Yeah, I, I wanna say yes as many times as possible. Okay, good. Right. Like like that's the it's like the beauty and the curse of agroecology. Uh, sometimes answering what is not agroecology is way harder than what is agroecology. Okay. Right. So what I heard from this description is is that there's some there's some food production. There's a diversity of crops. Uh, and so then what I like to do is say, OK, yeah, so you have an agroecosystem. What's the what's how can you level up? How can you encourage some of these other uh, features of agroecology, whether it's biodiversity or resilience uh, into your system? Do you have a pest problem? Uh, you know, kind of what's your, what's your next target? What's the thing that you want to in improve in, in your uh, agroecosystem and sort of go at that from a, a nature-based uh, solution? Um, okay. So yeah. Well, kind of go. jumping off of that, um, Martina wants to know, how does agroecology help with pest control? And oh, sure. Yeah, so so this is a uh, one that uh, is kind of debated uh, through the through the science, but I think the concept is 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 pretty well established, which is that by having biodiversity, 
uh, by encouraging resilience and, and those systems uh, that work among the, themselves that you have the control built into your system. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples. So I love spiders, right? Uh. <laughs> you, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm the kind of person that I got a spider in my home. If I have the opportunity, I'll pick it up and I'll let it outside. Uh, but we have all sorts of orb weavers uh, between our fruit trees. And, and I, I, I love to run into them uh, up until the moment that they stick to my face. Um, but, uh, you know, so if you're spraying pesticides, then that's likely also taking away your spiders. And if you don't have a predator in your system like a spider, then you're not going to have that control. The, the way that this gets complicated is there really needs to be built in some uh, level, uh, there's a level of um, redundancy or, or level of, of functioning in your system. So if you're just like, well, I put two cover crops, where are the spiders? Right, it kind of takes that commitment to biodiversity, to that long-term development of the system, so that nature can return to your agroecosystem, or, or nature can find itself there. Um, the other example I might make uh, is one maybe that I, I give as a, a bit of a non-expert, but but let me go for it. What I hear is that the uh, HLB disease in citrus acts much differently in China, where it's from, than where here in Florida. Okay, the psyllid bug and the disease has just totally wiped out citrus. Well, I mean, you know, hyperbolically maybe, um, but we don't see that necessarily in China. And what I've heard is that two specific reasons. One, the disease and the bug evolved in China. So there are predators and there are resistance within their systems. Two, what I hear is that Chinese agriculture is much more patchy you get some oranges and then you get some vegetables and then you get something else and something else. And so there's not as large scale of oranges. And so it takes a while for those psyllids to move through the system because there's the biodiversity, because there's that heterogeneity. And so you might lose a one to five acre planting of oranges, but your neighbor still has oranges. And so they can help you with the oranges. And, and so uh, it's just an example of how complexity and biodiversity in a system uh, might promote those sorts of uh, pest management. It, it's, it's IPM as well, uh, encouraging those predators uh, and uh, kind of finding that balance, so. Right, that um, diversity really having that impact. Um, it's really cool to see. Um, and so I have a couple more questions and then I have one that I want to end with. So we're getting, okay. we're getting there, but, um, Helen would like to see the QR code again, if you, if you want to go yep. back, although that was a great picture of you, uh -oh. but <laughs> <laughs> here we are. Okay, great. Fantastic. Um, so Janice Spencer says that sweet potato is a great cover crop in Florida and it's a win-win. And I've actually seen sweet potato in a um, residential landscape being used as a cover crop or as a ground cover for the summer. They harvest and then they put another winter rye or some cover on top of it for the winter. So that's a really nice, nice point. Yeah, Janice. I totally agree. Um, at the school that I was talking about, uh, we've got some mounds that we're trying to get started. And we started with the sweet potato. We uh, put the sweet potato in there for some biomass. You know, the kids get to, uh, you know, I basically dumped a pile of sweet potato onto the mound. And I said, hey, kids, put this in the ground. If, if there's a definition of random, it's, it's how the kids planted the sweet potato on that mound. Um, we also tried loofah, you know, so there, there's all sorts of different things cool. uh, to try. And, and that ground cover, that's, I think, a really critical one for Florida is, is figuring out uh, kind of how that lower layer uh, is going to interact with the other sort of uh, things that you're trying to do with your land. Great. So I'm going to ask two questions at the same time. So one is from, and so I'm going to ask one and then I'll put the other one on top of it. Um, some people plant, um, Dolores says, I plant specific herbs that pest avoid near vegetables. And then um, Maria says, Do plant, does planting onions and garlic around vegetables help to keep pests away? What about cilantro, parsley, and rosemary? So I'll just yeah, sure. throw that out to you. Yeah, there's a lot of great information about uh, plant associations. Uh, trap crops uh, would be one of them. So having some having a, a crop where a pest prefers to go instead of your, your crop, that's one. Or a barrier crop, uh, like you were mentioning, we're all about that. 
I'm all about that. I, I really like that idea. Um, we were talking about sunflowers earlier. Sunflowers have been shown uh, to, to do some of that as, as well, um, but they also attract the birds. You know? And so, so there's a lot of different trade-offs here. Um, I, I, the, the, this is the challenge in answering what is agroecology or how do I do agroecology? I can say, yeah, that sounds like great agroecology. But then when you get to doing agroecology, you got to try it and you got to see what happens. Does you got to have onion... that, that notebook that you started us out with. Right, know? right, right. We're taking notes, we're, we're journaling, we're making sure that we're paying attention to what's working, what's not. And just like the three sisters may not work in South Florida, you know, these, these systems may not work somewhere or that combination may not work somewhere else. So yeah, that's right. Great. And the only other thing to say, um, which is again, kind of me being a transplant here um, is, is things that work one place don't work everywhere. Uh, and, and so kind of appreciating uh, that opportunity to try, uh, I think is, is, is really important. So you hear a lot like do, do cover crops. That's like probably the thing I hear. Is not is cover crops agroecology? Well, yeah, absolutely. But, but maybe not the same way everywhere. Right. Is that um, sun hemp behind you? In it the is. Photo? Uh, so, so this is a, if you're, you're asking me about the photo, um, I've got, this is a multi-species cover crop trial that I did. Um, so we planted them separately, but also in pairs uh, to look at the um, uh, productivity of the system. Uh, so cut into the chase, having two species in the system, increase the bio, uh, biodiversity and the productivity. Um, sun hemp is a good option, at least commercially down here. Now what's in front of me is Mucuna prurians, which folks uh, might recognize also called the velvet bean. So it's a legume uh, grown in a bunch of different places. We gave it a try. Uh, it worked well in our experiment, but it also quickly escaped our experiment. Oh. And so mucuna purians is not a good uh, option because it's also invasive, uh, you know, uh, unless you're going to be like watching it every other week. Um, it also stains your clothes and makes your arms itchy. Yeah, so so uh, that's the whole story. <laughs> Um, so Linda uh, asked a question a long time ago, and I wanted to get to it, but, um, and, and it's how, how do you fit agroecology into apartment or condo living? And I have a feeling I know the answer to this, but go ahead, Zach. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Okay. I mean, we, uh, I sort of tried to mention early on about how plants uh, contribute to our well-being, right? And plants produce oxygen. It, it's as simple as that. And so having plants in your house uh, has been shown time and again to improve your, uh, you know, uh, happiness is the word that comes to mind, but I don't know if that's exactly what it is. Maybe it's just because you're caring for something and not as much as the oxygen. Um, but then I would say, add some food, right? Try a window box of uh, lettuce or try a tomato on your patio or, or just something. It'll be the most expensive tomato that you've ever eaten but you had a chance to interact with your tomato, maybe appreciate kind of what your uh, tomato farmer is going through. And then if you kind of stretch that and not only are you doing a little bit, but your neighbor's doing a little bit and the, um, they've got the storm water on the sidewalk and some raised beds on the sidewalk, then you can imagine a whole community of, of food and plants and, uh, and, and then you can you know, uh, participate in, in, in that agro ecosystem. So. Yeah, and and what and everyone eats food, and what if you were to seek out those producers that do participate in agroecology? Then you're part of the system at that point too, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. The consumer side of things is is just as important. So um, uh, one side is kind of the intentional production of of food and and fuel, but you can encourage others to do that. And I would argue that's a part of agroecology, right? Being a thoughtful consumer. Uh, kind of voting with your dollar, if you will, if, if you go and you say, okay, I understand there's problems with organic, but I'm willing to pay the, pay the premium just to show our uh, commercial agriculture that that's important to me. If you take some time to go to your local farmer's market and uh, find those producers that are actually growing the food in, in, uh, in, your, in your neighborhood, uh, that's again, participating uh, in uh, our food system uh, and uh, contributing uh, by, you know, by, by way of, of this uh, agroecology uh, concept that I'm trying to promote. Great. Okay, so we're getting close to the top of the hour and I just wanted to um, 
to share this with you. Um, Elaine said, the graphics you use for your presentation remind me of video games. I Googled to see if there are any agroecology video games and voila, there are quite a few. And okay. um, so, and I, and from our conversation last week, it was like, oh my goodness, someone's putting all this together. So yeah, there is sort of a kind of a movement behind that. You want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Well, uh, I just kind of, because the answer to agroecology is so challenging, I've been thinking about this like a game myself, right? Where you kind of put together the uh, goal, you set up the rules for your game. Uh, and then by going through this agroecology approach, by doing agriculture, uh, you're sort of starting to spin the dials and try the things uh, in order to make that uh, target. The argument is if that we're all doing that, if we're all trying to improve our agroecosystems little by little, uh, then we're going to see that transformation in the food system. I'm going to have to find those video games. That'll uh, be a good uh, educational tool. She said uh, National Geographic. So. Oh, okay. okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. Well, we have, um, there's a few uh, holding on questions out there. If anyone wants to follow up with the, uh, Dr. Brim on that, go ahead and shoot him an email. Uh, I have a feeling that this is just the beginning of agroecology and the Master Gardeners kind of sharing that information and knowledge with each other and us being involved with, uh, with where your program is going, Zach. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, it was a great presentation. We really all enjoyed it so much. So all right. I appreciate everyone being here. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Uh, hope to hear from you soon. Okay, good job. All right, I'm going to close this out.